Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Sarah Levin, and I'm the executive director of Jemena, Jews Indigenous to the Middle East and North Africa. We are a nonprofit organization based in California, and our mission is to achieve universal recognition to the heritage and the history of the one million Jewish refugees from the Middle East and North Africa and their Mizrahi and Sephardic descendants. Jemena is one of the very few organizations in the United States that's advocating for the rights of Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews, and we operate through an education and engagement program and an advocacy program. So throughout the year, Jemena leads a number of education programs for the general public, both here in the United States and in the Middle East, to learn about Jewish refugees and Mizrahi and Sephardic Jewish heritage. But we also lead a number of programs exclusively for our members. We recently led virtual tour, Jewish tours to Yemen, Tunisia, and Morocco, and we have an upcoming tour to Kurdistan planned for October. If you're interested in joining us and having fuller access to our programs, I encourage you to become a Jemena member. You can visit our website, www.jemena.org, and with a contribution, you'll gain fuller access to the range of our programs. I am very excited about today's program as we are featuring some of my heroes, Gina Waldman, Rachel Wachba, and Lynn Julius. These three women have broken so many glass ceilings in their long careers, but the one that is most meaningful to me and I'm sure to many of you is that through their individual and communal efforts, these three women created the international movement to pursue recognition and justice for the one million Jewish refugees from the Middle East and North Africa. These are the women who have persevered against a mountain of odds to pave a path that has inspired and empowered hundreds, if not thousands, of young Sephardic and Mizrahi activists to feel pride in their family histories and identities, and for some to become bold advocates for the rights of Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews. So I'm going to introduce each one of them, and then we're just going to jump right in. So we have with us today Gina Bublia Wildman, who is the co-founder of Jemena. As a young woman in 1967, Gina was ethnically cleansed from Tripoli, Libya, along with the vast majority of her Jewish community. Settling in the United States in the early 1970s, Gina has spent the last 50 years dedicating herself to the cause of freedom and human rights. Gina led the Bay Area Council for Soviet Jewry in the 1970s and was instrumental in winning freedom for thousands of Soviet Jews. Gina also fought human rights abuses in Argentina and Chile, and in the early 1990s, she helped in the resettlement of Muslim refugees from Bosnia to the San Francisco Bay Area. Gina co-founded Jemena in 2002 to bear witness to the experiences and stories of Jewish refugees from Arab lands. We are also joined by Rachel Wachba, a San Francisco Bay Area-based writer, psychotherapist, and the co-founder of Olivia Travel, a lesbian travel company. An Egyptian Iraqi Jew, Rachel was born in India and grew up stateless in Japan. The many dimensions of her exile and displacement are a constant theme in her professional work as well as her activism and writing. Rachel is a published author of several anthologies relating to being a Mizrahi Sephardi Jew of Egyptian and Iraqi parents, and she writes extensively about the indignity suffered by Jews who were forced into second-class demi status in their homelands. And finally, we're joined by Lynn Julius, the British-born daughter of Iraqi Jewish refugees. Lynn Julius founded Harif, the UK Association of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa in 2005. This organization aims to raise awareness of the history and culture of the vanishing pre-Islamic Jews from Arab and Muslim lands. It also seeks to advocate for their rights. A journalist and blogger, Lynn has a daily blog about Jews from Arab and Muslim lands that has a global following, Point of No Return. You can visit www.jewishrefugees.blogspot.com. I highly recommend it. This is a source of so much news and information. After years of research, Lynn's book, Uprooted, describes the plight of over 850,000 Jews displaced from their homes in Africa and the Middle East after the Second World War. She entwines personal case studies with first-class historical research and clarity. So we're just going to jump right in. Gina, I'm going to start with you. 
You were an influential leader in the mo movement to free Soviet Jews. You led the Bay Area Council for Soviet Jewry in the 1970s, and you later went on to advocate for diverse oppressed communities around the world. It wasn't until the early 2000s that you co-founded Jimena with Joseph Wahed. I'm really curious to hear how your work in freeing Soviet Jews influenced your activism on issues related to Mizrahi Jews. Were there lessons learned or experiences you had during your work advocating and freeing Soviet Jews that contributed to your fight for recognition of Jewish refugees from the Middle East? Uh, well, the, uh, how I got involved was basically that um, I worked for many years, like you said, as a director of the Bay Area Council for Soviet Jewry. And I learned from many uh, fellow Ashkenazim, actually, that um, organizational structure, and I learned uh, activism. Uh, one of the things that I found out as I was the director, that one of the uh, things that the Soviets, for, it's a very, there was a very big difference between the approach that we take for Jimena to educate the public on the Jews of Arab countries and what I did with Soviet Jews. And the big difference is that there were multiple organizations from coast to coast that had already educated the American Jewish public on the plight of Soviet Jews. However, nobody, and I say nobody with a capital N, knew about the Jewish refugees. So the approach itself was completely different. We, in order for us to advocate for Soviet Jews, we had to do things that were very gimmicky to embarrass the Soviet regime during the communist regime. So we did, for example, demonstrations. I, I know some of the photos may come up. Demonstrations uh, where we had hunger strikes. I chained myself to the Soviet consulate. And then when the judge, uh, when they threw us all in, they took us to the Northern Station and arrested us. I told the judge that if he put me and the 11 rabbis that had chained themselves to the gate of the consulate, if he put us in jail, we would go on a hunger strike. So he said, okay, and he, he knocked the gavel on his desk and said, free the prisoner, and we were out. But what was so fantastic is the KGB and um, the Soviets uh, took this as a very serious uh, uh, embarrassment for their government. So we did things that we are not doing now because in, in the case of the Jews of Arab countries, we first had to do one major thing, which is to educate about the plight of our people, that to educate and to show that the Middle Eastern had two groups of refugees, yes, the Palestinians, but the Jews, from Arab countries that nobody talked about. And uh, the international community had never really recognized the fight. So the approach was very different, but the building the infrastructure of the organization, uh, I, I really learned a lot from the Soviet Jewry uh, background. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is, I think, one of the major differences. Uh, we now have, you know, when, when I spoke at different colleges. The first thing I did was to use my story as my story as being the story of one million Jews. So that's how it evolved. And then Joe Wahed, of course, was my co-founder. And he always started the speech like this. I'm a Jew. I, I, I'm a, a refugee from the Middle East, but I'm not a Palestinian. I'm a Jew. So each one of our speakers spoke from personal experience, started their speech that way. It's amazing. It was like a domino effect of people being empowered to share their personal stories to educate. It's yeah. really, really amazing. It wasn't, it didn't come from books or news publications. It came from people feeling empowered and emboldened to share their stories. So I think we're all so grateful to you for leading yeah. the way with that. Um, Lynn, moving on, you're the daughter of Jewish refugees from Iraq, and you founded Harif, which is a London-based organization that's similar to Jemena, 
It was created in 2005 to raise awareness to the issue of Jewish refugees. What was your inspiration to start Harif? What are some of your accomplishments and maybe even what are some of your challenges? Well, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, I'm very honored. So as the daughter of Iraqi Jewish refugees, obviously I was not born in Iraq, I was born in Britain, but I was keenly aware of the plight of Jews from Arab, uh, in, in Arab countries when I was growing up. Because in the 60s, I did have relatives trapped in Iraq uh, when nine Jews were executed in Baghdad's Liberation Square in 1969. And who can forget that terrible event? Uh, but the real wake-up call came with 9-11 because I think we in the West were then all confronted with radical Islam uh, but minorities who'd been ethnically cleansed from the Middle East experienced a feeling of deja vu. They recognized that implacable hostility and the genocidal anti-Semitism at the heart of Islamism. And um, in the early 2000s, I know um, JJAC, which was Justice for Jews from Arab countries, was set up. And shortly after that, Jemena was set up. And so I took inspiration from the fact Jemena was set up. I felt there was a movement uh, afoot to really raise awareness of this um, absolutely essential uh, issue. And this inspired me to establish Harif in 2005. Now, Harif is not, is not a, an organization of the size or sophistication of Jemena. We are just a group of volunteers. In fact, there are only five of us. Uh, but um, I, I think we have um, achieved some headway. Uh, the British Jewish community, like the American Jewish community, is predominantly Ashkenazi. And there was a huge amount of ignorance about Mizrahim and Sephardim. Uh, we hope we have, um, you know, eroded that ignorance a little bit. Uh, we, we hope we've educated a little bit. We have spoken in schools, we've spoken in universities, we've spoken at, at Limud. Um, and lately we've been running an active Zoom program which is open to everyone and that, that can get hundreds of people coming. So I'm, uh, I am I am sort of heartened by the fact, I, I hope we have achieved something. It's not enough. There are many challenges ahead. Um, and I think that the main challenge actually, as Gina said, is really education. And, and we have to start um, at home with our own Ashkenazi community. And I think I'd like to see us all singing from the same hymn sheet, if you like. Yes. Ashkenazim and Sephardim and Mizrahi. Well, I have to say, Lynn, that you created something that was really innovative at the time and that continues to sort of lead all of our movements, and that's your blog. You were the first person to, to set up a blog and to really start mass distributing news, aggregating and distributing news for people all around the world related to Mizrahi Jews and Sephardic Jews. So aside from your work with Harif, your blog has been extremely helpful for Jemena. We use it every single day. Oh, I'm, I'm really delighted. Of course, the, the book did grow out of uh, the blog. And um, I like to think of it as a sort of news agency for Mizrahim and Safadim. And only today, um, I, I found out that a, a Jew in Morocco has actually been stabbed to death. And I looked up the Jerusalem Post. I looked up uh, the Times of Israel. There was absolutely nothing about this. Uh, so I looked up, uh, I don't know, whatever medium I could find, I found an Algerian uh, yeah. medium carrying the story and I was able to write something on point of no return about this and actually break the news of it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, sad story, but at least it's up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rachel, 
My Great. understanding is that your activism really started in the 1970s with the women's rights movement. Can you talk about how feminism and the women's rights movement of the 1970s influenced your activism on issues related to Mizrahi Jews? Like Gina with the Soviet Jewry movement, were there lessons learned or experiences you had in the women's rights space that contributed to your fight for recognition of Jewish refugees and Mizrahi Jews? Yeah, first I wanna say though, it's a thrill being with Gina and Lynn. Um, you know, I, I get to live really near you. We're neighbors, love it. Um, and uh, to see these incredible women, I don't know. It's just like, hopefully I'll be articulate and no, not overstimulated by all this because there's so much to say. Um, you know, my activism actually um, didn't begin in a vacuum. It didn't begin in the women's movement. Um, my activism as a Jew, which predates my activism as a Mizrahi activist, began in third grade. Um, I was in Catholic school in Japan, and in third grade, I found myself having to fight being, you know, for being a Jew. And I was told, listen, look, look at this, so, you know, there's Jesus hanging on the cross. It says King of the Jews by his crown of thorns. Why, Rachel, aren't you... Uh, uh, you know, being like Jesus, accepting him as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> My answer in eighth grade was, if he's a Jew, why do I have to convert? And that went on through my school years in the Catholic school, where being a Jew was very, very difficult. It was in the 50s, uh, up to 1964. And in eighth grade, my last year in that particular school, I gave a talk, an oral book report on the Holocaust, thinking that, okay, they're going to get it. They're going to understand how all this leads up to, all this anti-Semitism can lead up to something unspeakable, the Holocaust. That's not the result that I want. The results were, I didn't get the results I wanted. I was told Jews have to convert. And until we do, we will always be persecuted. And that counts. So now I find, so then I come to the 70s and uh, in the 80s and I'm in the women's movement. And what I find is it's okay to be Jewish, but not okay to be too much of a Jew because... If you're too much of a Jew, you're going to be a Zionist. I mean, there's no way to be a Jew and not be a Zionist. It's synonymous. Like, um, and I and I, I got into the women's movement because I felt well, you know, Zionism is uh, liberation for the Jew. Feminism is liberation for women. So I thought that was pretty clear, and um, I got into this movement, and I I thought. You know, because of the intense anti-Zionism I found, because of the affinity towards brown people in this movement, um, Arabs are brown, Jews are white. This is Ashkenazi-dominated narrative. And where, in fact, Jews and Arabs come in all kinds of country, uh, colors, and from all kinds of countries and in all colors. So when you go to Israel today, you'll be hard pressed to see who's a Jew and who's an Arab. But that's beside the point. Okay, so I happen to be a brown one. And I thought, okay, I'm going to talk about my family history. I'm going to talk about Mizrahi Jews. And so although I was in a feminist movement, I found that my calling was to educate around Mizrahi. So I, I talked and talked and talked. And, you know, I hate to say this, but it, it made some difference. Um, not a whole lot. You know, the, the difference I was able to make was co-founding Olivia Travel. And, and by co-founding Olivia Travel, make a safe space for lesbians to feel normal by, you know, being on a ship, be it a cruise ship, a land-based um, vacation, a riverboat, where we get to feel as normal as Jews feel normal in safe Jewish spaces. Um, 
however, you know, the women's movement, you know, we're, we're, we're always told that you have to choose. I was always told, choose between being a woman of color or choose between being a Jew, choose between being a Zionist or, you know, you're not going to get this job. And I did lose jobs. Um, because I could never, you know, what do you identify more as, you know, an Arab or a Jew? And of course I would lose my job because I would you know, try to finesse the answer, but it wasn't good enough because I couldn't lie. And uh, I grew, you know, in the seventies, you know, there were posters on the walls of our meeting spaces with Arafat and this is lesbian feminism and they were glorifying Arafat. So, those were not safe spaces anymore for Jews and for many Zionist Jews and Mizrahi activists. It's, LGBTQ spaces are very often not safe. Progressive spaces are not safe. And what we found today is we have a Linda Sarsour saying you cannot be a Zionist and a feminist. Wow. I just want to go back to what you said in the very beginning and recognize a name that each of you could spend days talking about your lives in these programs. And it's really hard to wrap all this up into a one hour program. Gina and Rachel, you, I know your activism goes back to your childhoods. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, you've both written, you've both published. If people are interested in learning more about your lives, there's a lot out there on the internet, but this one hour program is not gonna do justice to all you've experienced. So moving along, sometimes I receive questions about the relevancy of Jewish refugees from the Middle East and North Africa in conversations about the current state of Jewish affairs and Jewish people in 2021. People want to know, why is this important today? Jews have the state of Israel. We're well established in countries around the world. So I want to ask each one of you, why does the story of the one million Jewish refugees from the Middle East and North Africa matter? Why should the Jewish community be paying attention to Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews in this particular moment of time that we're in? So Gina, I'm going to start with you and then Lynn and then Rachel. I think it's very hard for Ashkenazi Jews who are born and raised in a country that is, has democratic values and, and free uh, uh, Judeo-Christian values to even comprehend what it means to be able to enter a school class like I did and have a teacher say at, at the age of six to the little girls in Arabic, if you have 10 Jews and you kill five of them, how many Jews do you have left to kill? That is the kind of experience that we Jews from Arab countries have lived through. And this was the norm uh, that, that took place in our lives. So for us, when we have, uh, in my case, I escaped with my life and, uh, uh, you know, during 1967, uh, we boarded the bus, they were, the, uh, Libyan Arabs tried to uh, burn the bus we were on going to the airport and, and how we were rescued by British Christians. For us, it's, it's a real life experience. So when I see anti-Semitism taking place, um, language that, that is, like Rachel said, that is completely anti-Semitic. When I see the likes of uh, uh, you know, the, the, the women's movement, some even the Black Lives Matter have expressed some extremely anti-Semitic and very pro-Palestinian, um, you know, rhetoric. Um, I often wonder if any of these people have even heard of us, have even heard of what happened to us and the laws that are implemented within Muslim societies against Jews. I wonder if they actually know that a Jew in Alexandria, Egypt, cannot walk around with a yarmulke by the beach, whereas Muslims and Arabs can't do it in Tel Aviv on the Tayelet. Hmm. They don't know. They don't know, but they make judgments. And, and there is always this uh, correlation of, well, the, the Jews um, 
um, are present Palestinians and the radar goes on. So I think that uh, it, it's very important. The story that we tell is very much first experience. So that's why it's important and we keep telling the story and we have to educate our own Ashkenazi Jews to empower them with our story. Our story is going to be the one, I, I don't want to use the word weapon, but it is the one powerful thing that they can use at every opportunity they have. When they talk about refugees, the subject of the Jewish refugees has to come up at the same time. This is the best mechanism that we can use every single time. And I think that this is what Jimena and Harif and organizations like ours can do, empower the community with the story. Lynn, go ahead. Right, well, why do Jewish refugees matter? As you said, uh, Sarah, Israel exists and, and Jews had somewhere to go. And the problem was essentially solved in a sovereign Jewish state, which gave unconditional citizenship to any Jew, no matter how old or sick or destitute. But that sovereignty is still being contested. In fact, the rejection of Israel as a Jewish state is the main reason why there's still a, a Middle East conflict. Um, and that has got something to do with the way Jews are perceived and treated in the Arab and Muslim world. Now, there are three main reasons why Jewish refugees matter. The first is they are important for peace. Uh, and, and it is a matter of truth and justice that we should have a, an undistorted view of history and the truth. Um, it's also a matter of justice for the Jewish refugees themselves because they are entitled to recognition and, and even compensation. Um, they are important as long as the Palestinian objective is not a state, but the right of return to Israel proper because if, if two, is, two sets of roughly similar numbers of refugees exchanged places in the Middle East, we should take the Jewish refugees into account and hopefully that would lead to peace and, and reconciliation. Secondly, the plight of Jewish refugees has to be seen as the result of Arab and Muslim anti-Semitism. And as Matty Friedman says, Jews are in Israel not because of the Nazis, but because of the Arabs. Um, and we have to also see the plight of Jewish refugees in the context of the treatment of minorities. Um, and it is a myth that um, the creation of Israel uh, created these Jewish refugees. In fact, um, the root causes of the anti-Semitism predate uh, the establishment of, of, of Israel. And you only have to see that minorities with no Israel of their own uh, have been driven out of, of the Middle East. So this points to some kind of dysfunction in, in Arab and Muslim society. You only have to look at Afghanistan today yeah. and the way that the Taliban are trying to impose Sharia law, they're trying to get rid of the remaining minorities this is this is what they stand for. It's it's an ideological uh, problem that we're up against. Um, so, which brings me to the third reason why Jewish refugees are important, and that is Islamism, because anti-Semitism and anti-other bigotry is at the core of Islamism of the ideology, and they can only accept women and Jews as dhimmis with no rights. And then there's another reason why Jewish refugees are, mm. are important, and that is because their existence actually dispels all the myths prevalent, especially on the left today in the West. And I know we can't really go into that, uh, but all all the myths, the settler colonialism, the indigenous myth, the um, white um, supremacist myth, everything. 
So I'll leave it there for the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Rachel. A way to, you know, basically reiterate what Gina and Lynn have said. In order to understand the Palestinian-Israel conflict, you have to understand the long history of anti-Jewish racism in Arab lands. It was, you know, it's portrayed as, hey, but it was so golden, and 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 just your family had a problem. No, and and no, and 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 eight hundred and fifty thousand don't flee because it's so golden. You know, six hundred and fifty thousand fled to Israel in transit camps. Most of my family, my Iraqi family, my Egyptian family, were in the Mabarot. We were already in Japan. Um, we became stateless. They were in the Mabarot. It, it's 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 just you know it's a very convenient. You know, do you think Arafat didn't know that that eight hundred and fifty thousand Jews were kicked out, forced to flee? Do, do Arab leaders don't know? They know, but they fed this lie, and they fed the Zionism is racism lie, and this lie is trending. It didn't go away. It's trending. And BDS is, is, is built on this lie. Um, so many of my friends, they don't know. And when they know, they still don't know because, <laughs> because the lie is enormous. And um, so, uh, you know, we cannot take Israel's existence for granted. Yeah, with the 20 year anniversary of the Durban conference coming up in the end of next month, Jimena is really hoping that we are gonna be able to empower some young people to speak up and share their family stories to dispel this myth that Zionism equals racism. So anyways, going back to issues related to feminism and women's leadership, Gina, you've often talked about how you grew up in a traditional Libyan Jewish community where women didn't have the same opportunities as men, professionally, academically, or even spiritually. Yet you defied the social norms that you grew up in and you've led multiple social justice movements. I'm curious, I, I know a lot of the other young Jemena women leaders are curious where your leadership skills as a woman derived from. Why and how were you able to choose and pursue a path that was so divergent from the traditional roles of most Jewish women in Libya? Um, oh. I, I really actually, it was very unusual for, uh, when I was 14 years old, I decided I wanted to go to school in Switzerland. Um, and when my father said, no, there is no way, no girl is going to go to school by herself in a foreign country. And he, my father said to me, if you get, if you go out of the country, get an education, you may never be able to find a husband. And I went on a hunger strike for four days. And finally, my, my father relented and sent me to school. So my, uh, the big milestone for me was when I tried to enter Switzerland, and, I, and as a Jew living in a Muslim country in Libya, I didn't have a passport, but I have a travel document. When I arrived at the border and the policeman was checking my travel document, he wouldn't let me through because I was 14 years old and I was entering the country without a proper passport, therefore no nationality. Therefore, I would be someone that could uh, ask to become a refugee in Switzerland. That was a no-no. So after he inquired at the consulate that was there a 14 year old running away in you know, this and that, he told me to sit in the waiting room and I was gonna take the, sec the next flight back to Tripoli where I came from. So at one point I realized I didn't speak any language except very little. I spoke Italian and Arabic at the time. So I, at, at one point I realized what I had to do I, as the plane was boarding, I rushed to the officer and I pulled his arm and I said in English, uh, Monsieur, Monsieur, me no passport because me Jewish, me no passport because me Jewish. And I was crying and I was crying. At that point, I saw his face. He looked at me, he stamped my travel document. He opened the gate and said, Benvenue, ma petite. Welcome, my little one. 
That taught me that if you have an injustice, you must speak up. And that is how I started my career as a 14 year old, as a human rights activist. Wow, that's an amazing story. Yeah. yeah. That's a really amazing story. After that, of course, I got arrested multiple times in outside the Soviet consulate, and I got arrested three times. This time, I was with John Baez. I don't know if you can see. I, was, yeah. I, have, I have that sign that says, no personal freedom in Russia. John Baez is there, and that was one of my very beginning activism. And then uh, uh, I organized uh, women, uh, I organized multi, multi, multiple um, events. This was when we went on a hunger strike for Anatoly Sharansky. And uh, we followed Soviet uh, delegations everywhere they went and we confronted them. And finally the Soviets had enough and that's how they started releasing prisoners. Wow. This is me with Anatoly Sharansky. Amazing. But, uh, Gina, I have a very quick question yeah. for you. Did, growing up in Libya as a child and as a as a young um, teenager, did you have any women like idols or women who you looked up to? They it could have been women in your family or women yeah. in the United States. Who uh, inspired you? Um, actually, I have to say that. Uh, they were not women that I knew, uh, but I did know that the women in my community did a lot of charitable work, but they were not really recognized in, in many ways. Um, I, I have to tell you that two years ago, three years ago, I went to an event recognizing um, 50 years since the exile of Jews from Libya. It was a huge event with nearly a thousand people in a very large theater in Rome because a lot of Jews, and they were honoring uh, people. And at one point there was a slideshow and they honored about, if I'm not mistaken, 10 or 12 people. And only one was a woman. So I stood up in front of a thousand people and I started shouting on top of my voice and said, Dove sono le donne? Where are the women? Where are the women? And all the women started applauding me. <laughs> but the men said, oh, the, the MC guy got up and said, oh, my God, it's true. Dove sono le donne? Where are the women? So I have to say that to this day, the women in my society have a way, ways to go. I mean, of course, they have different roles and they have, um, they're more emancipated and they have gone to college. But they still take a pretty traditional role. Okay. Uh, Rachel, in my mind, you are the epitome of an intersectional feminist. You hold multiple identities that intersect in a variety of ways, both positive and sadly sometimes negative as well. Um, you were born as a stateless refugee and you remain such for the first 20 years of your life. You are an immigrant. You are a woman of color. You are a staunch Zionist, and yet you identify as an Arabic Jew, which is really unique for Mizrahi Jews like you. Um, you are also the co-founder of Olivia Travel, the first ever lesbian travel company in the world. As the Jewish community is becoming more and more diverse, young Jews are more and more likely to be like you, holding multiple identities in ways that are messy and sometimes very complicated, especially as it relates to Zionism and connections to Israel. So what is your advice to young Jews, particularly women, who are grappling with issues related to their Jewish identities or even their Zionism? Um, for, well, let me just answer the easiest one first, which is, um, identifying as an Arabic Jew. You know, I, I always try to say it's Arabic, the adjective, not Arab, because we were never allowed to be Arab. We were not, we didn't get that privilege. You can be an American Jew, you could not be an Arab Jew. You could be an Iraqi Jew, but a second class Iraqi Jew. So we were never whole, except in our Jewness. That could be whole. And so what my advice would be, um, and, and when I say, again, the Arabic part, it's a cultural, not a political identity. Um, then 
I think our political identity have to be as Jews and Zionists. That is going to hold us. Otherwise, you know, goodbye. I mean, you know, some of my, you know, Zen teachers, they would actually get up in public in front of an audience that's mostly Jewish Americans and say, you know what, ha, 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 I'm only Jewish on my parents' side. And I had to go up to them and write letters and blogs and do whatever I need to do and say, it's not funny. It's not a joke. You are a Jew. And from there, I hope, you know, then you find Zionism because it's synonymous. We are a people and we are, we are a Jewish people and we are Zionists because we need Israel. Israel gives us a conscious or unconscious self-esteem like Jews have never known before Israel. We kicked out of one country to another. We, at any, any government's whim, we can be put up or put down. So today, um, young, young Zionists and, and, and maybe particularly feminists, but not really, it's, it's the progressive Jews are being pressured uh, to be less Jewish and definitely not to be Zionists. And this I find actually terrifying. Um, that's why I admire, you know, writers like, you know, Ben Freeman, who writes Jewish Pride, and he's a young Jew writing about Jewish Pride, rebuilding a people. And I tell everybody, you know, here's Lynn Julius's book, you know, read it, find out the history where if you're guilty about being white, guess what? We're not white. Um, and then if you need to know more, Martin Gilbert's amazing book in Ishmael's house, the, the, the story of Jews in Arab lands. So um, it's really important to demystify what being a Zionist is. And in the gay movement, we showed that, right? You know, 1980, my mother couldn't say lesbian. By the time she died in the 90s, mm -hmm. she could. Um, a lot of Jews can't say Zionist. It's like, mm -mm. you know, when I first came to the United States, a friend of mine said, stop saying Jew so much. Can you just say Jewish? No, I'm gonna say Jew. I'm gonna say Zionist. I'm gonna say Zionist 10 times a day. You know, it needs to be demystified. It needs to be seen as a good thing, not some aberrant, weird, evil influence. I love the advice to pick up a book and read. I think it's something that most young people need to do, especially um, young people who are feeling alienated or disconnected or even angry at Zionism. So. I think that's great advice. Lynn, your perspective in your work is, is different from Rachel and Gina, and partially that's because of your geographic location in Europe. Um, from the perspective of an American activist like me, you're the primary person leading efforts in Europe to pursue recognition and justice for Jewish refugees. You've organized or participated in multiple hearings at the British House of Lords, in hearings in other European countries and in Israel. Can you just enlighten us a little bit and talk about how the issues of Jewish refugees from North Africa and the Middle East is received in Europe? I, I'd be curious to hear about some of the challenges that you've had, if they're similar to the yes, challenges. Yes, well, it's it's a hard... So, yeah, go ahead. Yes, well, uh, as, uh, as I said, sorry, my signal is, is a little bit shaky here. I hope you can hear me. Um, but um, yes, it's it's a it's a hard slog because, as I did explain, we we are uh, oh, about uh, Mizrahim and Sephardim. But as you mentioned, we we did have a historic debate in the House of Commons in June uh, two thousand and nineteen, and I can I can certainly not take the whole credit for organizing that. There was a whole team of us, uh, but it was very exciting because we had MPs, represented, wow. parliamentary representatives, all parties, including the Scottish uh, and the Northern Irish, and they were actually having a debate about this subject, which was unprecedented. Uh, the problem is, 
you know, you have to sustain the effort. You know, we, we've since had another general election. There are new kids on the block who need educating. And, and this is something which uh, Harif, as an organization, just cannot do on its own. We really need the British Jewish community. We need uh, the leadership of the community to help us do this. I mean, we have man. community uh, organization. Mm. Are you there, Lynn? Can you hear? Still so much more to be done. Yeah. I don't know if you could hear me there. Yeah, it dropped out a little bit, but I, I think it's really interesting because it sounds like some of the challenges that you've had in the UK with getting some of the big Jewish agencies to help keep this momentum going is very similar to some of the challenges that we've had here in the United States. I do think here in the United States, things have changed a little bit these last few years. Um, some of the major Jewish organizations are starting to do more consistently, not just one off. I'm wondering if that is also happening in the UK a little bit. Yes, I think it is happening. Uh, and also we are now represented on the board of deputies, which is like a Jewish parliament. Mm -hmm. um, and that is very important. Um, you know, we have a presence there and uh, the leadership of the board of deputies is very aware of us. They're involved with the 30th of November commemoration now, which didn't used to happen. So, you know, we have made progress. Yeah. But but I think we're still viewed as a sort of niche issue, you know, that only concerns uh, other I think people do not see our story as part of the Jewish story, you know, um, and and still we still have so much more work to do. Yeah. Okay. So. As we close, I want to address, I think, the most pressing issue that all Jews are dealing with today, which is anti-Semitism. And I'm going to ask each of you the same question. So with the explosion of anti-Semitism that we're seeing, what is your outlook? What does the future hold for American Jews, um, Gina and Rachel? And for Lynn, what do you think it holds for European Jews? And also, what do you think we as concerned members of the Jewish community can do about that? I think that your response to this is critical. And I think that we need to do more to ask Mizrahi Jews, Jews born in Arab countries, what their outlook is, because their orientation, their background is different. And they have a, a deeper understanding, I think, of some of the current manifestations of anti-Semitism that we're seeing today. So uh, Rachel, I'll start with you and then Jen, uh, Gina, it looks like Lynn may have dropped out. So Rachel, do you wanna go ahead? And I have a, uh, I'm afraid. Um, I am afraid that um, American Jews, I think because they don't understand, so many don't understand or are afraid to understand, um, anti-Jewish racism uh, in the Muslim world, uh, afraid to be then called Islamophobic, and are very um, busy ignoring that. And what do I say? Um, you know, I had to leave my reform synagogue because of the rabbis, lovely people, but rabbis, Ashkenazi rabbis, who felt that they were having existential crises every time Israel had to defend itself against terrorism, against Hamas. Uh, that to me is terrifying. They're not out as Zionists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, years ago, I heard several rabbis come out as Zionists, and now they're going back in the closet. So while the rest of the world is coming out around gay, trans, whatever, Zionists are going back in the closet. <laughs> this is, I love this. Right? 
And I think what we really need to do is demystify this word Zionist. What is Zionist? You know, my a woman I ended up being with for 30 years, one of the big reasons we ended up being together was she found me at one of these parties with Arafat on the wall. And I was wanting to leave the party. I couldn't take it. And she came to the kitchen and she said, American Ashkenazi Jew, are you a Zionist? And I snapped back. What do you mean by Zionist? Very defensive. And she said, the right of Israel to be a Jewish country. I'm like, oh, we moved in two, two weeks later and we're together. We were together for 31 years and founded Olivia. But um, I, am, I am very worried about the distancing from Israel. And um, that needs to change. That needs to change because it's not going to be okay to be just Jewish in America and ignore Israel. Israel is endangered. We cannot take it for granted. Israel gives us our self-esteem as Jews. And I can't even say that enough. Yeah. Gina. <clears throat> well, I think that one of the major educational hurdles here is also, <clears throat> and I'm not sure where it falls, is the responsibility to educate our young people about how Muslim leadership treats their own people. I think it's very important, for example, I know Jimena has now uh, a, a very um, active Facebook and uh, outreach to Arabs. I think it's important that Arabs themselves get educated. Uh, they have to see what leaders like the Hamas leaders are doing to their own people. They have to see how they cheated them out of their own freedom, that they cheated them out of a life, out of an education. We have millions and billions of dollars that have gone in through the UNRWA programs and other programs into the Palestinian territories and hardly any, if any, has been spent to educate young Palestinians and been able to give them what I call a life. These are young people who are uh, educated in a culture of hatred. It's the culture of hatred that keeps propagating itself. So I know you ladies are covering the Jewish section. I wanted to touch on how I, if I was an Arab growing up in Ramallah, and I, I know I have Palestinian friends grew up in Ramallah, and they are told from the age of three, do not talk to the Jews, do not take the food from the Jews because they're going to poison you. And that culture of hatred. Okay. The entire time that way. If that does not change, then you're going to have a really, it has to come from. Oh, no, Gina. Gina's dropped out. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, it's, just, so. it's coming. Okay, so it's very hard. You have to educate, I think, both sides of the river. Yeah. Because otherwise you're swimming upstream and yes, we can educate all we want, but so long as people, even young people, my children's age or their friends, uh, keep telling my kids that Israel is the aggressor, Israel is the colonializer, Israel is uh, torturing the uh, Palestinians and killing their children and bombing their schools. Well, you're gonna have a lot of sympathy. They don't tell them that Palestinians put uh, you you know use the schools and the nursery schools to put their missiles on top of the roofs that they don't tell them Lynn oh. yes sorry no, no, what, what oh, was the so question you dropped out. I apologize. <laughs> so we're talking about the current rise of anti-semitism today and what is your outlook um, and what do you think we can do yeah Right, well, uh, anti-Semitism is a three-headed dragon, as the journalist Barry Weiss puts it. Yeah. There is far right, 
far left and Islamist anti-Semitism. Um, in Europe, I would say France has suffered most from uh, anti-Semitic Islamism and Jews have actually been murdered for being Jews. Uh, in Britain, we haven't quite suffered to that extent. Uh, no Jew has actually been murdered, but synagogues and Jewish schools have now had security guards and iron gates for many, many years. And you in America are only just starting to experience that. But our, our most recent challenge, I would say, came in the form of a, a man called Jeremy Corbyn. Mm. Uh, and it would have been an absolute disaster had Corbyn become leader of uh, the opposition. And he represents far left anti-Semitism. Well, he says he's only against Israel, he's, he's not against Jews. But as you say, you can't be Jew, a, a proud Jew without also being a supporter of the state of Israel. And I think we Mizrahim have experienced that conflation mm -hmm. of, of being a Jew and being a Zionist. And in the end, our, our enemies don't ever... Uh, manage to make a distinction. In the end, it's all the same for them. Uh, and this is something which the far left has not grasped. And it, it's it's something which which many Jews who cover for the for, for left-wing anti-Semitism haven't grasped. Mm -hmm. That in the end, they they they're, they're out to get you. They will get you as Jews, not as Zionists. Um, so I think this is something that people can learn from the experience of Mizrahi and Sephardi Jews in the Arab world. I think it's, it's very worrying that you in the US are, are experiencing a drift towards uh, um, anti-Semitism in the Democratic Party and the squad and, uh, and, and all this sort of thing. Um, as I mentioned before, I think we can do a lot to dispel the current lies and the myths. Um, you know, one thing that isn't touched on very much is, you know, that we're accused of being colonialists, but in fact, the Dhimmi system that was in place for 14 centuries in the Muslim world was a form of colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, it was the exploitation of Jews as uh, as little better than chattels or slaves. We were right down there at the bottom of the pecking order. Um, we had no rights, you know. Um, and this is, you know, and, uh, and, and in so many ways, the Mizrahi argument can be used to counter uh, these lies that are believed uh, by so many people in the West. Um, you know, and, and um, that's why, that's why our cause is just so relevant to today. It's not a matter of history at all. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but I think we just need uh, to empower people to talk about mm -hmm. us, you know, and, and for people to, to, to just spread the word, really. Yeah, I think, um, you know, and that's, that's our best hope. Yeah. And connecting what you just said back to what Gina said about founding Jemena and how it started as go, as her and a small group of others going to college campuses and sharing their personal stories, that is so necessary and that continues to be necessary. And I, I want to respond to a question that just popped up, which is what can we do if we're disconnected? I think people in my generation whose parents or grandparents are from the Middle East and North Africa, we have a responsibility to learn their stories and to bravely and boldly share their stories when we're given an opportunity. And I think that is is a really easy starting place. Yeah. Um, anyways, I want to thank the three of you. I feel and honored to know you and to continue to work with you and to learn from you. 
you're just like these huge pools of wisdom and knowledge and experience. So I'm happy that we were able to do this program. Thank you. And I want to thank everyone for joining and watching. Um, these, this program will be available online on Jimena's Facebook page and on our YouTube page. So feel free to email the links to people who wanted to join today, but who were not able to. I also want to urge each of you to support Jimena with a donation. If you like programs like this, um, you can visit our website and there's a big donate now button at the top of the screen. We rely on the support of individuals like you to produce programs like this and to get the stories like Gina's and Rachel's and Lynn's out there. So thank you so much. Um, and I also want to say Shana Tova, Happy New Year to every single person who's watching this and to all of your family and friends. I think we can all lift up prayers for health and well-being and happiness for this next year. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank Have a you. Great day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank.